Propofol is one of the most widely used anesthetics, and I think it came to probably the public conscious in the United States and around the world in the wake of you know, Michael Jackson's unfortunate death because it was the drug that he had taken or was administered to him and was responsible for his, for his death. How does it work? How does it create the state that you know, we call anesthesia? Well, anesthesiologists use it in probably two ways, maybe three, let's say. So one is to rapidly induce unconsciousness. You give a big bolus of the drug, and the patient becomes unconscious. The other way they use it is to keep you unconscious once you are unconscious by running an infusion. And the third way is just for light sedation when you're coming for a procedure that doesn't require you to be completely unconscious under anesthesia, but just requires that you're lightly sedated, such as for like a colonoscopy or maybe for an endoscopy or, or a procedure like that. Anesthesia is the state in which a patient is unconscious, is, doesn't remember, doesn't feel pain, doesn't move, but is hemodynamically and physically state and uh, hemodynamic and phys hemodynamically and physiologically stable. Propofol is used primarily to create this unconscious state. You may have seen this video on YouTube of like the Tacoma Washington Bridge. The Tacoma Washington Bridge when the right amount of wind hit it, started to oscillate like this, when wind coming from the right direction at the right speed. In other words, what the wind had done, it had found the resonant frequency of the, of the bridge. So the bridge oscillated, okay? So think of communication as cars going across that bridge. So once the bridge starts doing this, this part of uh, Washington can't communicate with that part of Washington communication is blocked because you have an oscillation. Something very similar happens in the brain. When anesthetics, and propofol in particular, acts in the brain, it generates oscillations. It's these oscillations which impair communications between different parts of the brain. All right, now why do we, why do we think this? So here's what we do. We take you and we measure your electroencephalogram, your EEG, your brain waves. And I look at your EEG and I actually see there's a certain level of activity, a certain number of microvolts. So let's say it's about five microvolts. I give you propofol, and all of a sudden, what's about five microvolts may go up to about 20 or 50 microvolts. So the signal to noise ratio in the brain under anesthesia is much higher than when you're awake. For that to occur, again, just thinking very grossly, kind of waving hands here for a moment, large parts of the brain must somehow be acting in unison, kind of doing the same thing. Parts of the brain must be in resonance or working in unison. And what we've come to appreciate is that what, that's what propofol does. At the receptor level, it binds to what are called GABA-A receptors. These are inhibitory receptors, so it enhances inhibition. And it, these receptors are all throughout the brain and central nervous system, so the drug goes all throughout the brain and central nervous system and causes this effect. The brain has 10 to the 10 neurons. They're highly interconnected. There are a lot of feedback loops. So when you actually apply a stimulus or an input to a system that has a lot of feedback loops, unless you just completely damp it, it doesn't shut off. It finds its resonance fre resonant frequencies. It actually oscillates, right? And how it oscillates depend up depends upon how the stimulus is applied, meaning how much drug is delivered, and what parts of the brain are being affected. So what we've come to appreciate, and this has been known for years, when you administer propofol, you actually see two very prominent oscillations. You see one at 10 cycles per second, like that, and you see one at about less than one cycle per second, a slow oscillation. So this one is called an alpha oscillation, 10 cycles per second, and this one is a slow oscillation, one cycle per second. Right? What we figured out in our research is a little bit about how these oscillations come about. So, and we've done this by doing some modeling studies and also by studying this in humans as well as in animals. So what we think is occurring is the propofol causes the thalamus in the cortex to go into a 10 hertz oscillation, right? Because it dries one area, that area becomes resonant, this area is highly connected, and so now you have two areas like this that are highly connected and in resonance. The slow oscillation comes on 
right at the same time as the 10 hertz oscillation. And what we've learned there from our studies where, we, where we've placed electrodes in the brain of patients under anesthesia is that when the slow oscillation is present, neurons in the cortex can only fire spiking, can only discharge spikes or action potentials at the minimum of the slow oscillations. And areas which are separated from each other fire spikes at their minima. So in this region, the minimum is here. At this region, the minimum occurs at a different time, which makes it very difficult for the two regions to communicate because spiking activity cannot occur throughout all phases of the cycle. So the cycles, the oscillations in this case, are a marker of cortical fragmentation. So you have two things, a resonant frequency, like this, kind of like a hum, a hum down your phone line, which means that if you were talking and you said, okay, Emory, this is all great and everything, but I want you to give me this lecture and I want you to give it to me, you get one frequency and you got to keep the amplitude the same. So everything I'm saying now becomes hmm. That is what propofol is doing. It creates these hums that basically impair, that impair communication between different parts of the brain. I've given you an idea of how propofol works, um, but is that the answer? Is there no more to study? I mean, what else is, you know, what else is new? Well, I think there are a number of things. So, for example, um, are there ways to modify these oscillations so that we can control them such that we could have maybe less deleterious effects on the brain? All right. If this is the way that the oscillations are working, if we could control them better, maybe we could keep you under anesthesia very precisely and then bring you out, you know, whenever, once we are, you know, precisely done. I mean, this is something which we would love to understand. This is a, insights we have for one drug, but we'd like to go in and understand the oscillations for other drugs. We have hypotheses about how they're occurring, but understanding in detail how they're generated. And I think the other thing is, if we stand back from it and we say, okay, the drugs that we have now work by creating oscillations. Is there perhaps a more physiologically sound way of doing this, such that if you generated brain states a different way, it might be without oscillations, but it would be in such a way that you had fewer side effects, maybe there's less nausea and vomiting, you're didn't have brain dysfunction after anesthesia. So this is where the basic science, understanding the basic science in more detail, would give us a lot more insight. To go after these questions, what we're doing is a series of studies in, in rodents, in non-human primates, and in humans to get more detailed information about these circuits in the brain and how propofol acts on them. Okay? And we're doing that also for other drugs. So you can think of it as kind of being a matrix. You have brain regions here, you have different animal species, and what you do is we're filling in the matrix, learning the details of how the drugs act differently in different circuits. And that's going to take us, you know, several years to get this worked out. But I think once we understand that, we're going to have a very, very detailed description of how these various brain states occur. And then if you think of it, there's another dimension on the matrix. What I've been describing at the moment has just been unconsciousness. But how analgesia is produced, huge question. So looking at some of the drugs that we use for analgesia doing exactly the same sorts of studies are the sorts of things that we're, we haven't started working on those, but other investigators are. So there's a very rich set of experiments and investigations that lie ahead to really totally unravel the, um, to gain a really complete insight into how anesthesia works. And what's interesting about how we investigate this, we have a very interdisciplinary team. We have anesthesiologists who take care of patients in the operating room and who help us do our clinical studies with patients in the operating room. We have statisticians like myself who work on you know, the data analysis. We have mathematicians who once we find dynamics and we show them that there are these patterns who help us then sort out like models for these dynamics. And based on those models, we then can go back in and do more directed and, and informative uh, 
experiments. We have engineers who've helped us design, you know, very special, you know, recording devices so we can maximize the information that comes out. So I think studying the question of general anesthesia really epitomizes the systems neuroscience approach because it really involves having an interdisciplinary team. Anesthesiology is a field of clinical neuroscience. In other words, nobody manipulates the brain on a day-to-day -day basis more than anesthesiologists. No one manipulates the brain more profoundly than anesthesiologists on a day-to-day -day basis. Yet, it's been viewed and we practice as if it's a field of pharmacology. It certainly is. A lot of what we do involves using pharmacopoeia, involves using drugs. But in point of fact, anesthesiology is a branch of clinical neuroscience along with neurology, psychiatry, psychology, neurosurgery, and let's say sleep medicine. Now why is that relevant? Because as we learn about the brain under anesthesia, and we learn about fundamental part functions of the brain because we study anesthesia, that's going to help us learn more about treating pain, helping patients recover from coma, maybe helping with altered brain states such as schizophrenia, or maybe coming up with ways of treating depression, and maybe new approaches to helping people sleep. So once we treat it as an integrated part of clinical neuroscience, then it has significance well beyond the significance that it has for coming up with better ways to take care of patients who need surgical care.